Hey folks, if you want to maximize your survivability as a Metamorphosis Warlock tank, the Demonology Talent Tree is going to be your best option. Thanks to abilities like Soul Link, the Demonology tank build is able to withstand far more damage than other setups, making it ideal for undergeared players or anyone that wants to feel completely indestructible. That being said, there's still quite a lot of nuance to playing Demonology thanks to talents such as Master Demonologist, and it has by far the most flexibility when it comes to rune selection. By the end of this video, I'll have taught you everything important that you need to know in order to properly build and play your Demonology Warlock tank. Alright, so as I said in the introduction, Demonology can be fairly complicated, there's a lot of ground to cover here, so before I get into the runes and like the rotation and stuff like that, the absolute first thing that I want to go over is talents. There is a bit of flexibility here, but I think generally speaking, you'll find that within the demonology tree, your standard build is going to be the same. Because every single demonology build will be going down here and taking soul link. Now soul link, I'm going to talk about it first because it is the reason to build for demonology. I've had a few people ask me whether it's worth going like midway through the demo tree and not taking soul link and taking other stuff. As it currently stands, at level 40, you have to take Soul Link. This is the main selling point of this build, because it gives you 30% damage reduction, effectively. It splits it on your pet, and 3% additional damage. The added damage doesn't really matter. You're mostly taking it, effectively, to have a mini shield wall up permanently. Also, some people don't seem to fully understand how this works. It reads like a passive. It is technically not a passive. It is actually an active ability. You press it once, and it has an infinite duration. So once Soul Link is actually active, it will never go away unless your pet dies, which can happen. The main downfall of Demonology builds is if your pet dies, you lose Soul Link, and now you just don't have it at all because it is taking a large chunk of your incoming damage. So the best piece of advice that I could give anybody playing Demonology, if you are in a group with other people who aren't familiar with that fact, tell them right out of the gate, say, hey, I'm playing Demonology, I'm running Soul Link, my pet will be taking 30% of my damage, healer, you will need to heal my pet. Now, this may seem like a problem, and it may seem like, well, are you really taking 30% less damage if the healer still has to heal that back up? But in practice, there's a lot of abilities that will heal multiple targets, including your pet, and you're going to be getting healed by it anyway, your group members are going to be getting healed, so your pet is effectively double dipping on that. So, in a sense, your staggering damage, kind of like if you've ever played Retail World of Warcraft and you played a Brewmaster Monk, you could think of this as 30% stagger, and this means that your pet is getting extra healing, which means you're almost taking twice as much healing from all sources. It is a very, very powerful ability, but it needs to be utilized properly because I've been in situations where people completely ignore Soul Link and my pet just rots out, and it is a nightmare. I have on screen here, this was a Nomergon pug that I did last night, and oh my goodness, it was bad. I had to switch to Demonology midway through just because the healers could not keep anybody alive, and I was having to effectively self-sustain myself. But that meant that my pet was just rotting out, and no matter how many times I said, healers, please heal me, first I was typing it in text, and then they finally made a Discord, and I said, please heal my pet. They just really didn't. I had to bandage my Fell Hunter midway through the boss in between Thermoplug transitions. It was bad. That being said, it was still much tankier than any other setup I could run. So even in the worst case scenario where your pet is not getting healed, you have options, and I will discuss that. But I did want to at least start off here with Soul Link because that is the main thing that you were going for. All Demonology builds lead to Soul Link. But going back up to the top of the tree, what are we going to be taking? So the most important talent, this is something that pretty much every Warlock build, even if they aren't going full Dima, will take at least some points in, is Demonic Embrace. Obviously, 15% extra stamina. I hope I don't need to tell you why that is really nice to have. It is just free survivability. Spirit does not matter for you at all. You will pretty much never benefit from Spirit, so the reduction effectively doesn't exist. You're just getting more health. Now, once you've taken these five points... There's a lot of random points that you need to spend to advance the tree. The early section of this demonology tree, it's not too impactful. So improved health stone is just nice extra healing if you need it. It helps you out, obviously, if you need to use your health stone in a pinch. And if you are able to create health stones for your other group members, then that is a nice little benefit. 
Now that's obviously only two points, so you'll need to spend five to reach the next row. I'll quickly touch upon some of the talents that I'm not taking here, and I think all three of these should never be picked up as you're advancing. First off, Improved Health Funnel. Ideally, you should never have to use this ability. I actually, unfortunately, in that same Nomergon pug I just referenced, was forced to use Health Funnel in between Thermoplug transition phases just because healers were ignoring my pet. This should never happen. This was a disaster scenario. Generally speaking, you won't be using this in any serious situation, and putting points into it is really not worth it. There are better options. Improved Imp is a weird one, because this is a very powerful talent for other builds. And in fact, most builds that spec some points in the Demonology will be taking Improved Imp. The problem is, for Demonology, I think this is a good time to scroll a bit further down the tree and talk about Master Demonologist. I mentioned this briefly during the introduction, but from here on out, we need to keep this talent in mind when we make all of our other choices, because it plays a big factor in why we're skipping certain talents that buff particular pets, namely Improved Imp. So you'll notice here, our Imp, when we have Master Demonologist, reduces our threat caused by 20%. That is obviously very bad. You obviously don't want to be reducing your threat as a tank, that's kind of a no-brainer, but there are other really good options here. Pretty much all of the other pets give us very powerful benefits, much stronger than reduced threat, which means that as a Demonology Warlock, Imp is pretty much the one pet you can never use. It is very, very, very bad. And not taking Master Demonologist just isn't really an option, and the other pet options are very strong, so you're not really going to be upset about losing out on the Imp. But this does mean that any points put into Improved Imp are completely dead. Now, as for Improved Voidwalker, the main issue here is that we aren't going to be using Voidwalker all that much. There are niche use cases for it, specifically for Demonology. I think most other lock specs don't really ever want to use Voidwalker. Demonology can, but we don't really gain too much out of this. Realistically speaking, this is only buffing Sacrifice, so the shield that you get from this. And while Sacrifice is a nice shield, you're only going to be using this in absolute emergencies. And I guess while we're on the topic, the main case in which Sacrifice will ever be used is in conjunction with Fell Domination and Master Summoner. You will be taking both of these. They're not amazing talents. You don't really need to use them a lot, but there's no better option. So these are pretty much guaranteed picks. And what you can do with this is make it so your next demon summoning is only 0.5 seconds, which is really, really, really fast. And you can do it in combat, too. So, in theory, you could do something like sacrifice my Voidwalker here, press Fell Domination, and then immediately resummon a new one. And now my Voidwalker's back, does start at only half health and mana, but I still carry the shield over for another 30 seconds. Really, there is no situation right now in Nomergon or Dungeons or anything where you should actually need to do this. The only fight where you will ever really want to run Voidwalker is on Mechanical Menagerie, and even then, I don't think it's necessary, it's just the only fight where it is somewhat useful. So, in theory, if your healers are really struggling, and you're on Menagerie, and you're running Voidwalker, and Cluck goes out, and all the bosses get an attack speed boost, and you want to sacrifice your Voidwalker, quickly resummon it, which, no, you can only do once every 15 minutes, so a little bit prohibitive there. That is an option, but that is such a niche scenario that will really only occur in exactly the way that I just described, to the point where Improved Voidwalker is just not worth taking. So, our only other option, which is what we'll be putting points into, is Felt Intellect. And this doesn't do a whole lot for us, because the only pet that actually really uses mana is our Imp, and that's one that we're not really going to be using ever as a Demonology Warlock, but on the off chance that, you know, your pet is running low on mana, this gives it a bit more space to continue casting. There are some once again, niche situations where your pet may run out of mana, but I would say they are a bit more common than the Voidwalker Sacrifice scenario, so if we have to pick, we're taking Fell Intellect. Now, moving on to Improved Sayad, this is going to be your bread and butter. This is a guaranteed three points, because as we can see from Master Demonologist down here, this gives you 10% additional damage. And in any situation where damage is your priority, Succubus is going to be your pet of choice. It does a pretty significant amount of damage, less than the Imp on short fights, but more than the Imp on longer fights, and thanks to this talent, when you are a Demonology Warlock, 
it gives you more personal damage. And this is a flat 10% that affects everything that you use. And we'll get to this later, but the advantage of this is Demo can run kind of any of the rune builds that some of the other playstyles use, because we're getting a lot of passive modifiers that don't buff any one ability in particular. It just buffs our damage as a whole, which gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we want to deal our damage. So as a result of that, of course, Improved Sayad is going to be really good because you will be using your Succubus very frequently or Incubus, you know, whatever you prefer. Now, in order to reach the next row, because this would be five points, let's say we put two here, three here, this would bring us down to this row, three here, one here, we would still need to put one more point, and that's why I have one point in Fell Stamina. Then we get down to this row, Unholy Power, increases the damage done by your pet's auto attacks by 20% or melee attacks. So your Succubus's Lash of Pain, that would also count for Unholy Power, I believe. So five points into that is going to be pretty much a no-brainer. Your pet's damage, while not a massive portion of your overall, is not insignificant. So that helps. And then we need to access Master Demonologist. So from here... We're going to be putting two points into Master Summoner as previously discussed. I'm taking one point in Demonic Sacrifice because it is required to get to Soul Link. I will quickly note, never press this button. It's unfortunate that it is a prereq to taking Soul Link. Demonic Sacrifice is completely worthless and there is absolutely no situation ever where you will be pressing this ability. It is effectively a wasted point to access Soul Link. That's just classic for you. There's a lot of talents like that. It is a necessary pick. Now, since I have two points in Master Summoner and one point in Demonic Sacrifice, I'm going to go back up and I have two points that I can either spend in Fell Intellect or Fell Stamina. I have put them in Fell Intellect. Honestly, it doesn't really matter, but if I had to respect this, I would put them in Fell Stamina. It's kind of personal preference. If your healer is keeping your pet up, the added health doesn't really make a huge difference, but... There are disaster situations like I showed before where every little bit of health your pet can get is important. And I did mention that your pet's mana won't usually be a concern. So I'd say you can balance them out. It doesn't really matter, though. You're mostly just putting two points here to advance into the next portion of the tree to take Master Demonologist and then finally to take Soul Link. Now, there are three talents down here that I haven't really talked about. Improve Firestone, Improve Spellstone, and Improved Subjugate Demon. Now, this is a bit of an interesting discussion. Obviously, Improved Subjugate Demon, you're never going to take this. You're never going to use Subjugate Demon, at least not in a real situation. Improved Spellstone, this is just something you're never going to use anyway, the regular Spellstone, and you can't even take it because it conflicts with Soul Link, so just kind of a worthless talent down there. But the main topic of discussion, so Improved Firestone, it's almost just not in the correct tree. If this was down in the destruction tree, like pretty much in the same spot right here, you would actually take it as part of the deep destruction incinerate setup. And I think now that we've gone over talents, in order to really explain why improved Firestone is not good and why I generally wouldn't recommend it, we need to discuss what runes you'll be running because that plays a big factor. So, hands, metamorphosis, duh, uh, waste. Now, at the time of recording, you can see that this is only a 5% damage increase for you or your demon. In a hotfix coming up in a few days, I believe on the Tuesday reset from when I'm recording this, they are buffing this to 25%, which is obviously a massive increase. As it stands, this is a terrible ability, and I'm not using it. But there's a very good chance that with the 25% buff, Grimoire of Synergy becomes your best belt rune. I don't know if that's going to apply for all builds because Destro, especially with its increased crit chance thanks to things like Searing Pain or Devastation, it has really high uptime on Shadow and Flame, in some cases 100% uptime. And that effectively amounts to a 10% flat damage increase, which if this doesn't have a very high uptime, this may end up just being better. Because obviously 100% uptime on 10% damage is better than 25% uptime on 25% damage. That being said, if this is something like 50% or more uptime on all builds, then it is just more damage. Plain and simple. It is just a flat damage increase compared to Shadow and Flame. One of the downsides of these runes, both being extremely basic percent damage increases, 
is that one of them will pretty much always be mathematically better. I have no way to test that. I have no way to know exactly how good it is going to be when the changes come in, but it is something to keep in mind. That is like the kind of thing that I will keep you posted in the pinned comments on this video. If next Tuesday, Shadow and Flame ends up no longer being the best in slot belt option, I will tell you. I suspect that for Demonology, though, it is probably already guaranteed that Grimoire of Synergy is going to be really good, because one of the advantages of this is that it buffs both you and your Demon. And for other builds, your Demon isn't going to be nearly as impactful in your setup, especially the Imp on longer fights is going to oom um itself. And if your Imp is doing big bursts of damage and then nothing, then the proc chance is really low. But your Succubus is constantly hitting the boss, it's constantly dealing damage, giving you a chance to proc Grimoire of Synergy, so... I would be willing to bet money that this is going to be the best rune after the buff for Demonology builds, because you will have most likely higher uptime on it. For the other setups, hard to say. I probably won't have those videos finished, the guides for these builds, until after the buff happens anyway, so we'll discuss it then. Hopefully I will have the math on that by the time the buff comes in. But generally speaking, both of these are comparable, and it doesn't really matter which one you use. Shadow and Flame even after the Grimoire of Synergy buff, will just be a pretty good buff. Uh, you don't have, I think, 100% uptime, like some Destro builds can get on this, but you can get pretty good uptime on the 10% damage bonus, so it is still very powerful for Demonology builds. And of course, Invocation is just terrible. Never run this. It's just really, really, really bad. Now, for Chest, this is the main one that I want to discuss. You are always, always going to be running Master Channeler, because if you are running Demonology then you are not concerned about damage. Now, that is not to say that while running this build, you shouldn't be mindful of your damage and trying to get it as best as it possibly can. That should be something that, as a tank, you are still doing no matter what. A lot of tanks fall into the mindset of, I am playing a tanky build, or I am playing a damage build, and my goal is only to do one or the other. I'm either the person who survives the big damage or the person who deals the big damage and does the threat and stuff like that. No. That is a terrible way to look at tanking. Every tank build has a mixture of both, and some are more survivability slanted, some are more damage slanted. Demonology is 100% a survivability slanted playstyle, but it still can put out really good numbers if you are playing it correctly. So you are not playing this build because you want to do damage. You are playing this build because you want to survive, but that does not mean that you still can't do damage. Hopefully that makes sense. However, what this boils down to is the two main damaging runes, Lake of Fire and Master Channeler, are what most builds are running. So if you're running like a Shadow Damage Affliction style build, which I will make a guide for later on, Master Channeler is obviously the best setup. If you are running the Fire Damage Destruction build, Lake of Fire is obviously the best thing to pick. But Master Channeler, and it's not even close, is the best survivability rune. And I think, generally speaking, it is just the best rune in this slot, because while the Lake of Fire buff does provide you with a lot of damage in a fire damage setup, it offers you nothing for survivability. While Master Channeler, even in a vacuum, is very close and gives you an insane amount of healing, like a ludicrous amount of self-healing from this rune. So, if you are already planning to play a tanky setup, there's absolutely no reason not to take Master Channeler. It would be trolling to not take this, because... If you are trying to build for fire damage as a demonology lock, I mean, just respect Destro. You know, at that point, just go full threat. So you want to build for survivability here, but within the context of that survivability setup, you still want to maximize your damage. Hope that we've gotten that out of the way. But since we've established that you're always going to be taking Master Channeler just because of the healing, and even then it still does a lot of damage, this also means that without Lake of Fire, you're losing one modifier that works well with Incinerate. And one of the advantages of that destruction fire build is that you're stacking a crap load of modifiers. You have 10% fire damage from Emberstorm. You have 100% increased crit damage from destruction. You have incinerate for 25%. You have Lake of Fire for 40%. A lot of that stacks up to magnify your searing pains to hit for an absolutely crazy amount. But if you start peeling away those modifiers, then each one becomes less valuable in a vacuum. And one of the other disadvantages of playing Demonology for the fire damage setup is we've already said that Imp does 
terrible things for demonology because of the threat reduction, and your imp's firebolt damage counts for Lake of Fire, that is actually a pretty significant part of that setup, so not having that means Lake of Fire loses even further value. And Incinerate is a really tricky rune to use properly, even in the best case scenario. I have said many times that I think it is highly overrated. It's not bad. It is good in very particular situations, and I will have a build guide for that, but a lot of people think it is just the best leg rune, and that is just not the case. Just because you're using Searing Pain a lot does not mean that spending 2.5 seconds to increase your Searing Pain damage done by 25% is worth it. Incinerate really doesn't hit as hard as a lot of people seem to think it does, and the only way to really make it shine is to stack it with all those other modifiers, as said, to make it really good. Without Lake of Fire, without all the really good stuff in the Destruction Tree, Incinerate just doesn't really have all of the same power that you see it have in all of those other builds. And one of the biggest things against it is that the Leg Slot has some of the strongest runes, and you're competing with some really heavy hitters. Now, my personal favorite, I've talked about this many times before, is Everlasting Affliction. This is what I would personally recommend if you want a setup that does high damage within the context of Demonology, for Mechanical Menagerie, this is the best rune regardless. There is no debate on that. I've gotten really good results with it. I talked about that in my Nomergon guide. It is absolutely amazing on that fight in particular. It's also really good in dungeons, but I would not recommend Demonology for dungeon tanking. That's something that I guess I'll quickly note here. This build is fine for dungeons. It's not bad, but it just is not really efficient because your AoE is not great. The main ways to do AoE are through dot spamming with Everlasting Affliction, which the other build that I discussed that goes Improved Corruption does infinitely better, or through Hellfire Spam, which is Deep Destro. Demonology just does not do AoE super well. It can in a pinch, but it's not its specialty, and generally speaking, your survivability in dungeons should never be a concern unless you are pulling literally the entire dungeon and trying to AoE it down, but in that case, you should never be face tanking things anyway. A lot of times, you're just trying to hold threat on mobs and kite them while mages or any other AoE, like I don't know, Rep Paladins or something, try to do all of the work in cleaving it. And your entire job is just searing pain, get things off of the damage dealers so they chase after you. There is really no situation where the added survivability of demonology helps you in a dungeon scenario, and having to like heal your pet in between pulls is just extra maintenance that you don't want to have to do because it just slows down dungeon runs, so I would actually say this is the worst spec for running dungeons. Which means that Everlasting Affliction, while still good on Menagerie, because you can get it rolling on those four targets at the start and then keep it up, is really only useful in that setup. So as a result, Everlasting Affliction really is mainly good on that particular boss, Mechanical Menagerie. It can be used on single target fights. I've discussed this before, but just to quickly restate, Let's say you're fighting Viscous Fallout or Crowd Pummeler or Electrocution or one of those bosses where pure single target, you never have to do anything else. You're going to put Corruption on that mob at the very start of the fight, and you will never need to worry about it again. And the entire fight, depending on how long your kill time is, that Corruption is ticking away, it's doing damage, and by the end of the fight, it will have amassed a large amount of damage. And the amount of damage that you got from that single button press of Corruption which you're usually going to be doing at the very start of the fight as you pull. You can start with like Immolate and then into Corruption or something like that. You're going to want to use your hard cast and then pretty much spam Searing Pain the rest of the time. It will have more than pulled its weight on a longer fight. And it's worth noting that your kill time really matters there. Because as you can see here, I've been in some demonic Nomergon pugs where it takes forever to kill some of these bosses. You have like two minute plus crowd pummelers or three to four minute electrocutioners viscous fallout usually should not take longer than two minutes but sometimes it gets really nasty and i think a lot of people that i've seen will look at builds like this and assume perfect conditions and say well if you're going to be killing the boss in 40 seconds like in a speed run kill why do you need everlasting affliction and that ignores the fact that for pretty much 90% of the player base, they are not killing these bosses in 40 seconds. Hopefully every group is not taking two minutes or longer, but the key to Everlasting Affliction is that the longer your kill time is, effectively the worse your group is, 
the better it becomes because you are getting more value out of that single corruption that you applied at the start of the fight. So that's something to keep in mind. It's a really good rune for single target bosses early into your progression. If your group is doing Nomergon for the first time, it's really nice there. And this trend will continue as the phases go on. There is a reason why Everlasting Affliction is so good on Mechanical Menagerie, because it is pretty much the longest fight that we've had so far in Season of Discovery, and you're getting it on multiple targets, so you are getting extreme value out of that. Honestly, the only reason it's not great on Thermoplug, and it's not bad there either, don't get me wrong, but you have to recast it at the start of every new phase when he transitions between mech suits, so you're not getting the full value because you actually need to cast Corruption four times in total instead of the usual one per target. So you're losing a little bit there, makes Everlasting Affliction slightly worse. Still not terrible, though. And yeah, as your guild or pug group or whatever gets a bit more experience with the raid and you start killing bosses faster, you can peel this off and go with some other setups, namely Demonic Grace and Demonic Pact. Now, Demonic Pact, addressing the elephant in the room with this one, it's obviously a pretty nice ability. It gives you increased spell damage and healing to your entire party by 10% of your spell damage. This not only buffs you, and makes your individual spell damage and healing stronger, it also means that all of your group members are going to be hitting harder, which in theory means that your kill times are faster. And I've seen people argue that, oh, this is the no-brainer pick because it gives your entire party a benefit instead of just giving you a slight damage boost. But I think a lot of people, once again, overlook the fact that in order to get value out of this, your party members need to be playing properly. And no shade to some of the groups that I've run with, I doubt most of them are gonna be watching this video, if any, I've had a lot of caster DPS that just really don't do a lot, and I'm doing the vast majority of the group's damage, and any spell damage that I gave to them would have been a complete waste. So I would view this as you are giving yourself a spell damage and healing boost, and if it happens to buff your party members, that's just extra. So on really fast kill times where you're going to be getting less value out of Everlasting Affliction and you still want to prioritize damage, you might get more out of Demonic Pact. It's hard to say for sure. And if you are in a group where you have absolutely pumper caster DPS and this is going to be really good for you, well, you probably already know that and there's a good chance you're not watching this video. So I don't really think that's worth addressing. If Demonic Pact will be good for your group, you'll probably know it. There's a good chance they might even ask you for it. In that case, it's up to you to decide, should I actually run it? Is this actually going to be beneficial? Hard to say. And lastly, Demonic Grace. Now, Demonic Grace, this is a very complicated subject that I have had a lot of discussions with people on, and I think in order to properly talk about Demonic Grace, we need to also talk about Dance of the Wicked. So I'm going to quickly touch upon feat runes. Demonic Knowledge is the best. I've said this multiple times, Demonic Knowledge, absolutely insane, gives you a bunch of additional spell damage and healing, 41 in this case. If I go into my bags and equip Infernal Pact Essence, which is one of the Blood Moon rewards, this gives you even more, so it's going to jump up in a second, because this gives your pet additional stamina and intellect, and that stamina and intellect does count towards demonic knowledge. Worth noting that fell intellect and fell stamina, despite the talent names, does not actually boost demonic knowledge, unfortunately. But this trinket does. You can see here it jumped from 41 to 53. So demonic knowledge is amazing. 53 additional spell damage and healing is massive. It is so beneficial. And it's competing with some of the worst runes that we've seen so far. Shadowflame, this is just terrible. Never run this. It desperately needs a buff or a change or something. I'm surprised it hasn't gotten one. And then we have Dance of the Wicked. Dance of the Wicked, so if you're not familiar, you and your pet gain dodge chance equal to your spell critical strike every time you deal a critical strike to an enemy. So, breaking this down because a lot of people don't seem to fully understand how this works. When you deal a crit to an enemy, you gain dodge chance for a set amount of time. It's not a super long duration. I forget exactly how long it lasts based on your spell crit at the time when you dealt that critical strike. And when that critical strike lands, you regen 2% of your maximum mana. Now, one thing just to get out of the way, the mana restoration is terrible now. It is absolutely dog water. It was really good at the start of the phase. It is low. Like, I ran it a few times, I checked my logs, I was getting absolutely no mana restoration. It was like the entire fight, I got a fraction of a single life tap's worth of mana out of this thing. It is really, really bad now. They over-nerfed it. I don't know what they did to it. It's gutted. 
The demon mana buff really only matters if you're running an imp, and even then if you're running a build that does use an imp, which demonology obviously doesn't, the mana is still nowhere near enough to give you a significant damage increase, you're still better off playing demonic knowledge. So, the dodge chance. A lot of people like to say Dance of the Wicked and Demonic Grace is really good because when you pop Demonic Grace, you're getting 30% increased dodge chance. So let me just go ahead and slap this on my pants just so we can get like a visual representation of what this works like. So this is giving you 30% dodge and 30% crit, which means that with Dance of the Wicked, when you land a critical strike, you are getting that crit chance from Demonic Knowledge turned into dodge chance in addition to whatever crit you have on your gear. So I have 1% crit here. That would also become dodge for however long the duration is. In fact, let's go ahead and whack something to test it out. All right, so I have Dance the Wicked on my boots. I have Demonic Grace. So I'm going to pop Demonic Grace and then I'm going to start attacking. All right, Dance the Wicked. 37% increased dodge chance. Well, that's not very good, is it? Now it's only 7%. It also completely ate the original buff. So I had 37%. Then I crit again, but because Demonic Race was gone, now I only have 7% dodge chance. Well, that's pretty shit. And a lot of people will say, well, if you have Demonic Race, you can get up to 80% dodge chance. And no, no, you can't. Not really. If you manage, like if that very first Searing Pain had crit, then for the one second window or so where Demonic Race was still rolling, when I had the Dance of the Wicked buff, I would have maybe had somewhere in the realm of 80% dodge chance. And you know what? If all had gone perfectly, there is a chance that that Raptor would have attacked me, and because of my really high dodge chance, I would have dodged one melee swing. Wow, that's awesome, right? Eh, not really. And especially you can see that that is like the perfect ideal scenario because outside of Demonic Grace, you're getting... 7% dodge chance, which is really not good. Dodge obviously gets exponentially better the more of it you have. It, there are diminishing returns after a certain point. When you get close to like, you know, 80, 90% dodge, that's like when it really gets good. There's like, I forget exactly how the math works. It's like an inverse bell curve or something in terms of how useful dodge is. But the main issue with dodge and the main reason why if you look at like retail World of Warcraft, and how tanks are being built now by Blizzard, there's a reason for it. Why is dodge really not baked into tank kits? Well, because it's just not very good. And a lot of people who are only used to classic gameplay don't really understand why dodge is not great, because a lot of old classic fights only have auto attacks. You know, you look at Patchwork. Patchwork is the iconic example of a really hard-hitting tank fight. Where is all of Patchwork's damage coming from? It's auto attacks. And yeah, if you dodge one of Patchwork's auto attacks, well, that's really big. That is a lot of damage mitigated. But because of the way that SOD is being designed, the current design philosophy is that we're getting more tank busters. We're getting Peck from the chicken on Mechanical Menagerie. We are getting tank busters such as Thermoplug Slam, the Super Cooling Smash, or the uh sprocket fire smash whatever the names of the three different types of smashes that he does are well those abilities will ignore your dodge chance they are not auto attacks if you have 80 percent dodge you are still taking a fully charged super cooling smash to the dome on thermoplug it does not matter whether you are dodging his auto attacks before or after and i think that is the main issue when we look at survivability because like i said before when it comes to building your tank you are not trying to just build, I am the survivability tank, I am the damage tank. You want to strike a nice balance. And if you are playing Soul Link, Demonology in general, you already have an insane amount of survivability. You're already taking barely any damage from anything. Now, if Demonic Grace was just free and it was just a button that you got for nothing and you could just press it and get 30% dodge every so often, it's a pretty shit button. I kind of skimmed over this, but like, the fact that it's on the global cooldown makes it significantly weaker because you press it. By the time I can even use another ability, it only has four seconds left. So you effectively have like two to three GCDs to actually get the proc within Demonic Grace. And then you kind of just need to hope that you don't proc Dance of the Wicked again to eat the original dodge chance boost that you got from Demonic Grace. It's really bad. Just the way the ability is designed fundamentally is really problematic. I don't really know how they fix this, but for starters, it needs to be taken off the GCD, and I don't even know if that's enough to make it worth running, but as it stands, it's just very, 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 very weak. 
But ignoring the fact that it's a weak ability and it's not even great for survivability, there is an opportunity cost to taking it. You have to sacrifice any one of these runes, which are fantastic for damage, no matter which one you're taking. Like I said, I would not recommend Incinerate, but Everlasting Affliction, one button to get an infinite corruption, really good. Demonic Pact, free spell damage and healing, and keep in mind, and healing, that applies to Master Channeler too. So this, if you want survivability, is also your best option. Kind of neglected to mention that before, but that does have an impact. So you are losing out on fantastic things here to take a slight dodge chance increase, which is pretty terrible on its own. And when combined with Dance of the Wicked, it's slightly better, but Dance of the Wicked is also terrible on its own. So it's two terrible runes coming together to make one mediocre rune. And in order to take it, you're losing out on a massive, massive spell damage and healing boost and a either mini spell damage and healing boost or a fantastic damage source. It is just not worth it to run this. It is nowhere near enough survivability even in perfect ideal conditions to justify losing out on this much damage and healing. You are going to get more survivability through your added self-healing, thanks to Master Channeler, than you will from the every so often dodging a melee attack thanks to the dodge that you get from this. I know it is a really hard thing for people who are not familiar with playing tanks, especially who are maybe used to the classic style of tank where avoiding damage is pretty much all that matters, blocking as a prot warrior, dodging and stuff because melee attacks are all there is. But we already have so much flat DR that we do not care about a tiny bit of dodge chance. It just doesn't matter. I cannot stress this enough. Now, I got a little bit sidetracked there, so I would excuse you for forgetting that this all started because we were talking about improved Firestone. So, going all the way back to our original discussion on improved Firestone, I think we have the proper context to explain why is this not worth taking. Well, in order to determine that, let's go ahead and actually create a Firestone. We can make a great regular Firestone here and pop it into our bags. And then we are going to compare it against the other ideal offhands that you should be running. I don't have every single offhand available here, but I have, generally speaking, a good representation of the nice ones. So what does Firestone do? Enchants the main hand weapon with fire, granting each attack a chance to deal 40 to 60 additional fire damage. And then it has plus 14 to fire spells and effects. Obviously, the 14 damage to fire spells and effects, that is pretty straightforward. Your Searing Pain, really only your Searing Pain, because the only other fire damage button you're going to be hitting with this setup is Immolate. This now deals plus 14. And if we were to take 2 out of 2 and improve fire stones and get plus 30%. All right, well, I have my calculator pulled up. 30% of 14 is... 4.2. I'd assume they're rounding down, so 4.2 plus 14 equals 18 fire damage. Awesome. So you would get up to 18, which I will note, with improved Firestone, this would become the highest plus fire damage offhand that we currently have access to. There is no other offhand right now that gives you 18 fire damage. The next best thing that we have is Umbral Crystal, which gives 17 shadow damage, and then the other offhands I'll discuss here, the Necronomicon and the Orb of No Arahil. Now, one of the other notable downsides to this is it requires you to have a good one-hander. Now, I am lucky enough to have Glimmering Gizmo Blade here. This is obviously insane, so if you do have your best in slot, which will be a dagger, then you can reliably run Firestone. But if you have a staff, then you just cannot use Firestone in general. So this is less of an issue when you actually do have the really good weapons or if you have Dagger of Willing Sacrifice from BFD. But I do want to keep in mind that for people who are just starting out who don't have access to all of the best gearing options, this is a notable downside to Firestones in general. It requires you to have a one-hander and an offhand, and sometimes just running a staff will be better. Now, the other thing I want to talk about for Firestones is you'll notice I have this little proc here. Firestone effect. That is the thing that is giving my attacks a chance to deal 40 to 60 additional fire damage. And we're just going to run up here and we're going to just stab this raptor for a bit. We can look. This is my damage breakdown. Firestone attack did 54. All right. Still stabbing the raptor. No proc. Nothing. Now, keep in mind... At the end of the day, proc effects like this are going to be RNG. So, this may seem like a little pointless. Oh, right at the end there, right as the mob died, I got another Firestone attack. 
Honestly, this is not terrible. I It's 6%. It's not really 6% because all I did was auto attack. And your auto attacks in general should be maybe like 1% to 2% of your overall. So in practice, this would have been 0.2, 0.5, something really low percent of my overall damage in a boss. It's really not good is what I'm trying to say. But the main reason why this is not only not good, but completely worthless, is that this is a weapon aura effect. This is mutually exclusive with other weapon aura effects like Lesser Wizard Oil. I meant to bring one when I was going to do this demonstration. I forgot it in my mailbox, and there's no mailboxes nearby, so... Oh well, take my word for it. Lesser Wizard Oil, which is your best weapon aura enchant, lasts for 30 minutes, gives you 16 spell damage, does not work with the Firestone thing. You are going to want to use this. And I would recommend that everybody pick this up. I have a lot of other really, really expensive, like not great consumables. If you're just starting out over here, I'm not even going to show them. I might make a video on it later on, um, but way too advanced for this type of video. But Lesser Wizard Oil, dirt cheap, five uses, doesn't expire on death. So it's the most efficient consumable you can get, especially if you're doing prog. Absolutely fantastic. Everybody should be grabbing one of these really, really, really good. Which means that Firestone, effectively, is just a plus fire damage stat stick. That is a really important distinction that I want to make because I see a lot of people getting misled thinking that it is giving them more than it actually is. This is only giving you the fire damage. You should never be benefiting from the Firestone effect. So, with that in mind, the fact that Firestone is either 14 or 18 fire damage depending on your talents, let's look at what our other options are. First off, Necronomicon, this is your best in slot as like an all-purpose offhand. This is from Nomergon. I happen to have this. You may not, but that's okay, because if we go to Scarlet Monastery Graveyard, Orb of the Forgotten Seer is plus 12 damage and healing. Almost as good as this. Extremely easy to get. You can solo farm Scarlet Monastery Graveyard. I even have a video covering that. Very, very easy to do. You should be able to get your Orb of the Forgotten Seer in no time. Everybody should have access to this. It's like the baseline. So effectively, you are getting two additional fire damage, and if you're running this talent, six additional fire damage. But what you are losing is the plus 12 healing that this gives. So you're losing the healing from Master Chandler, really, because that's your main source of healing. And that does add up. There's a reason why Master Chandler is so good, especially with all this spell damage and healing stuff. It is a tremendous amount of healing, and obviously self-healing is a form of survivability. We've already discussed that you're trying to strike a balance. So I've said a few times that it's worth sacrificing slight survivability things for increased damage. Well, the inverse is true. If you are getting a slight amount of extra fire damage from this offhand, but losing out on a massive amount of self-healing, well, that is just not a good trade-off whatsoever. But this is all a lot of words to not even touch upon the fact that, as we've already said, you're not going to be running fire damage stuff at all. So, this is giving you plus 18 pure fire spell damage to something that is pretty much just searing pain. Is that worth it? Absolutely not. So, okay, I think we've properly explained talents, we've properly explained runes. I will quickly touch upon future talent selections briefly before we move on because I am probably not going to recreate this guide for the level 50 phase. And I won't spoil the runes themselves in case you're trying to keep it to yourself, but we have already seen data mined versions of the upcoming runes in the next phase. The developers have said, do not take this as gospel. They're probably going to be changed. So I'm not going to say what they are in case you haven't looked. I'm not going to say whether they'll be good or bad because it is subject to change. But what I can say is that for demonology, it's not really going to change a whole lot. That's not to say the runes are going to be bad. It's just not going to fundamentally change how you build it or how you play it. They will just be like icing on the cake, effectively. So until we get to level 60, I don't think there will be any reason to recreate this guide and re-explain all these talent choices. That will pretty much stay exactly the same. Can't predict the future, but I'm just saying most likely. So I'm going to go ahead and talk briefly for phase three, level 50. What are you most likely going to put your points into? Now, the no-brainer obvious one is going to be Improved Corruption, because this is something that in any of my Affliction builds, any build that heavily uses Shadow Damage, this is really, really good. You're going to want to take definitely five points into this to get Instant Cast Corruption. I use this in a lot of setups. It is very, very, very powerful. In fact, it is one of the main weaknesses right now of Demonology that on multiple targets, as I said before, in Dungeon Tanking, 
you don't really get the full value out of Everlasting Affliction because you don't have access to Instant Cast Corruption. Even full Destro builds can technically take Instant Cast Corruption because the last few points after they take Ruin, they get some wiggle room there. So they could go into Ruin, take some points and improve Corruption, and still tank dungeons just fine if they aren't going with a Hellfire setup. But Demonology is currently the only spec that cannot do this. So next phase, this is a no-brainer, especially if you want to play Demo while leveling up. Absolutely grab this. Really, really, really good. I still think that a purely Affliction hybrid thing with some Destro abilities will be better if we're optimizing dungeon tanking. And once again, I will have a video on that. But for Demonology dungeon tanking, this will be massive. Going along with that, you could probably also take at least one or two points into Suppression just to increase your hit chance. This is generally speaking good for that style of build, especially if you're leveling up and doing higher level dungeons where your hit chance isn't guaranteed to be at 100%. But also for damage, I think improved Shadow Bolt for like a dungeon scenario is really good. I've talked about this a bit on the Mechanical Menagerie section of the Nomergon Guide. This increases your Shadow Damage dealt. Pretty nice. And also Cataclysm if you are not going with dungeon setup. So maybe a raid version of the builds would look something more like Cataclysm for Reduced Searing Pain, because you will still be pressing this quite a lot in Demonology. And then maybe like two points into Suppression, a few into Improved Corruption or something like that, just to make it easier to apply this at the start of the fight. And presuming that the next raid also has a 5% hit cap, you'll want to have at least one or two points into Suppression. None of the stuff down here is great. Improved Life Tap is not bad. So that's something you could take, I guess. Improved Corruption, Improved Life Tap, maybe put a few points into Improved Drain Life. That's maybe the only thing that I would say. You don't really need it a lot, but it's something to consider. But just want to touch upon that because I'm sure that like three months from now, whenever Phase 3 is, I'm going to get some comments in this video saying, hey, are you going to make an updated guide? Or, you know, what would you recommend now that Phase 3 is out? So I just want to cover my bases there. For all the people watching in the future, this was made in advance specifically for you. I hope you appreciate that. So the final thing that I want to talk about is just to briefly give a rundown on the rotation. Now, I think a lot of this you probably picked up just in passing by watching the video and hearing me talk about talents and stuff. But obviously, its rotation is kind of flexible depending on which runes you are actually playing with. So obviously, if you are playing with the Everlasting Affliction setup, then it is exactly what I described in the video for Nomergon describing Mechanical Menagerie. If you have yet to watch my Nomergon guide, then go check that out. I have it linked in the video description. The Mechanical Menagerie timestamp in particular will tell you exactly how to play that specific playstyle. And the only difference playing it as Demo versus playing it as the recommended Affliction build is that you will need to hardcast Corruption at the start of the fight. That makes it a little bit trickier because first off, you do have a chance to get resisted if you're not taking suppression. So that can kind of suck if you get really unlucky, and it's going to be a little bit spooky having the mobs running all over the place, but the first few seconds of the fight, you're not going to have cluck active, you're not going to have overheat active, the bosses won't be doing a lot of damage, it's very easy for the off tank to just grab the bosses, and if one of them's hitting a DPS, whatever, get your corruptions applied to the three main bosses, then get threat with searing pain, group them all up together, use shadow cleave to refresh your corruption on all three, then start applying your curses. On the topic of curses, for multi-target fights like Mechanical Menagerie, Curse of Agony is going to be your go-to. If you're putting this curse on a bunch of different targets and it's lasting for its full duration, it will do a significant amount of damage. With that being said, there are two other curses that we need to keep in mind, which are Curse of the Elements. You can see here, curses the target for five minutes, reducing their fire and frost resistances and increasing their fire and frost damage taken by 6%. And Curse of Recklessness, which increases their melee attack power by 45, but reduces their armor by 290 for two minutes. The ignoring fear and horror effects thing is a nice little bonus, but it obviously doesn't apply to bosses, which is mainly where you're going to be using this. Now, specifically on Mechanical Menagerie, if you are in a group that does not have people good at dealing with that, like I said, just use Curse of Agony. I've seen some people argue that, well, if you put... Curse of Recklessness on one of the bosses to help with the warriors, it'll result in more damage. In my experience, unless you have absolutely massive pumper warriors or rogues who would really benefit from the reduced armor on that fight, you're probably just going to end up carrying the damage if you are running my builds, and it is just better for you to use Curse of Agony. However, on every other boss, if you have a group with a large amount of melee DPS in it, 
In that case, Curse of Recklessness can be good because it reduces the armor. So Crowd Pummeler, Electrocutioner, Mechanical Menagerie, like I said, that one's debatable, and Thermoplug. On all of those fights, with a lot of melee who are doing good damage, it can be worth it to use Curse of Recklessness. However, if you do not have a lot of melee, which unfortunately for Warriors and Rogues, I know if any of them are watching this, they're going to be mad at me for saying this, they are not very good anyways right now. Most groups only opt to bring one or two just for buffs and things like that. Generally speaking, you are going to have a caster-heavy setup, and in that caster-heavy setup, Curse of the Elements is fantastic. This is especially good with Fire Mages, which are very strong right now. It's good for you because you have a lot of fire damage, but generally speaking, this is better with the Incinerate build because it's all fire damage than this setup, but it's still fine and... In terms of the overall group's damage, if you have good casters in your group who deal frost and fire damage, then this will really benefit them. Now, I have had some setups where I'm running with like a Feral Druid, two Boomkins, one Warrior, and like a, a Shadow Priest or something like that. And I have basically a group comp that doesn't really do a lot of frost or fire damage. It's like Nature, Arcane, and then like one or two melee. But the melee DPS are Grey Parsing. They're doing nowhere near enough damage to justify Curse of Recklessness, because keep in mind, it also increases the melee attack power, which means you're taking more damage. Generally, it won't matter a lot, but it is something to keep in mind. In those situations, if I'm running Demonology, and I know my group isn't benefiting from Frost or Fire damage, and they're really not benefiting from Reduced Armor anyways, I will probably just use Curse of Agony even on a single target. This is one of those where it's kind of a judgment call. I know that for a guide, it sucks to tell somebody that they need to make their own judgment call, but this is really one of those things where it is group utility. It entirely depends on your comp. I have no idea what group comp you're running with. I would say if you just don't want to think about it and you don't give a shit, my rule of thumb, press Curse of Agony unless somebody says, hey, can you use one of the other two curses? If I have a group of four warriors and they say, hey, can you please use Curse of Recklessness? Okay, I'll probably use Curse of Recklessness, but otherwise... You get the most personal damage in this setup, generally speaking, by running Curse of Agony, so just press that unless you make a judgment call otherwise, or you get asked to switch. Now, I've talked a lot about utility and curses and multi-target stuff. The one thing that I haven't really covered, at least not explicitly, is what is your single target rotation? Because I'm sure a lot of people are going to ask that. It's really straightforward, though. If you are running Everlasting Affliction, obviously you start off pressing Corruption. You don't need to do anything special. Once it's on there, it just refreshes. If you're not running Everlasting Affliction, I'm going to assume that you're taking either Demonic Pact or Demonic Grace, either for the added survivability or the added damage, in which case it's entirely passive. It does not affect your rotation at all. In that case, at the very start of the fight, you are going to use one of your curses. If it's one of the utility ones, then just make sure to apply that to the boss right at the start. If it's Curse of Agony, then you are going to put that at the start and then refresh it after it is fully expired because you want to let it ramp up to its maximum duration. And you are going to immediately press Drain Life just to get that healing going. That's really good, of course. Now, if you really want to min-max your damage, you can still pre-pull with Corruption because it is a two-second cast. Even if you don't have Everlasting Affliction, even if you're not refreshing it constantly, that still is a decent amount over 18 seconds. Helps you get that initial threat. And then you're pretty much spamming Searing Pain. You spam Searing Pain, you keep Drain Life up, you keep Curse of Agony up if that is your curse of choice. In fact, frankly, if you choose to be a utility bot and use one of these two curses, that is one less button in your rotation, which I know a lot of people will like, honestly. So for the most part, yeah, in that case, single target, it is probably, out of all of the different builds, the most straightforward on a single target. Now, I discussed this a bit earlier when we were talking about Master Demonologist, but there is one final thing that I didn't talk about. So Voidwalker... Succubus, Fell Hunter are the three pets you'll want to use. So Succubus is pretty much going to be your pet of choice in almost every situation. If you need to hold threat, if you want to do damage because the boss doesn't really hit you very hard. So pretty much the first four fights in Nomergon, you really shouldn't be taking too much damage. Unless people really fuck up on Grubbus, then maybe he starts hitting you hard and you could justify using a Voidwalker. But realistically, as long as a cloud doesn't get dropped on top of him, you won't need any extra survivability and you could just run with the Succubus. If you want to have a emergency shield on Menagerie, you can run Voidwalker on there because pretty much all of the scary damage coming out on Mechanical Menagerie is going to be physical. So having the additional 10% from Voidwalker can be kind of nice. The unfortunate thing is Voidwalker still does not generate nearly enough threat to ever tank mobs. So it might eat like one or two hits for you at the very start of the fight before you've established threat. But after that, 
it's just going to be sitting there doing very, very, very little damage to the boss and providing you with 10% DR. And 10% DR, it's not nothing, but when you already have 30% DR via Soul Link, I just would not recommend it. And finally, Fell Hunter. This is an interesting situation where getting plus 40 resistance is nice, but it can be hard to tell whether it actually makes a difference. So for reference, I showed some of this footage earlier, but last night when I did a last second Nomergon pug with a bunch of random people and it was an absolute disaster, I actually ran Fell Hunter on Thermaplug for the added survivability because the scariest parts of Thermaplug are those smashes. Even if you might mitigate a slight bit of extra damage over the course of the entire fight by running with a Voidwalker, resisting one of those massive smashes that could kill you in a pinch if your healers are not paying attention is absolutely critical. So I opted to play Fell Hunter for that, and I looked at my logs after the fact, and I asked some of my retail friends who are really good at reading logs for help in interpreting that, and they gave me this whole long speech about how resistances in Classic are really complicated and can't be easily interpreted by looking at a log, and I said, can you just tell me like roughly how much better my run with Fell Hunter was compared to my other logs, and then they just kept talking about how math is really complicated and they showed me all these different charts and stuff like that, and I'm like, look, I'm just looking for like a small fun anecdote to include at the end of my video to like explain to people the slight advantages of running Fell Hunter on a heavy magic damage fight. And then they said, well, if you try to give like actual examples without showing them all of the math and data behind it, you'll be spreading misinformation. And then I just said, okay, I give up. I, I don't really want to continue having this conversation. So I guess the moral of the story here is that on the Thermoplug kill where I ran a Fell Hunter, I resisted seven full magic damage tank smashes from like the little thermoplug frontals and across pretty much all of my other runs without fell hunter i mitigated two to three i i have to give you the disclaimer according to all my friends who are really good at math that this is just complete averages and with a non-resistance setup you could get really lucky and get even more resistances than with a fell hunter and a fell hunter could low roll and still get really low things and while having resistance on certain mechanics will give you slight damage reduction it's really hard to measure its impact when it's all or nothing it, it, it just like you know my entire point that i was trying to make to my friends is you guys probably don't give a shit about all that it's complicated resistances are fucking hell to math out the entire point that I want to make to you, and hopefully you can understand that without thinking I'm spreading misinformation, according to my friends, is that having resistance on fights like Thermoplug, where a lot of the scary damage is magical, is good. So I'm not going to tell you, mathematically speaking, that it's going to give you XYZ amount of increased chance to mitigate damage, or it's guaranteed to make you not take damage from a certain amount of smashes. All I'm going to do is, is give you a thumbs up on resistance fights. Thumbs up for Fell Hunter. It's good. It may not be good because math is fucking complicated, but it's probably good, and really that's all that matters. Like, that's all you probably give a shit about. It's probably good enough. So, if you want to run your Fell Hunter on Thermoplug, I would say it's not a terrible idea. One of the other nice things about having Fell Hunter and Thermoplug is if you're in a really shitty pug group and they don't want to get the kicks on the nature phase, you have Spell Lock. And you can actually kick Thermoplug as a Warlock. So I would not recommend this on any other fight. But since we know thumbs up for Fell Hunter and Thermoplug, thanks to the resistance and spell lock is added utility, it is a worthy consideration. But on everything else, pretty much just go with Succubus because having increased damage and threat is just going to be better. And also Succubus out of all of these does the most damage and it's not even close. If I look at my breakdown here for Mechineer Thermoplug, uh, this is not good by the way. I lost all my world buffs. I wasn't using consume. So, you know, don't judge my shitty damage in this pug. Uh, my Fell Hunter did across the entire fight, which was decently long, 7.9K in terms of general damage. And uh, I'm not gonna look at Menagerie because on Menagerie, my pet was dead. The entire time pretty much right at the start of the fight my pet just wasn't healed and it, it literally died within like 20 seconds of the fight starting so yeah that sucked like i said that's one of the main frustrations of playing demonology uh and if we look here this was our kill right yeah linksia did 8.3k across a what's the, the length of this fight and i i think i can see this Electrocutioner, combat time, 2 minutes, 26 seconds. Linksia did 8.3k. 
Thermoplug seven minutes, and it only did 7.9k. So my Fell Hunter did less damage across seven minutes than my Succubus was able to do in a little over two minutes. Just to give you a general idea of the damage difference between these. And Voidwalker does no damage. Voidwalker just tickles the enemy. It does absolutely nothing. If you are running Voidwalker, you are only getting the 10% physical DR. Fell Hunter, you're at least getting the resistances and interrupt and some okay damage, but nowhere near Succubus. Now, obviously, this is a lot to take in. This video is already long enough as it is. I hope you enjoyed watching this. I tried to keep it on the shorter end, and that just didn't work. It's really difficult to make these types of videos, because on one hand, I like to do really tightly edited stuff where I'm looking over a script and thinking about every single word and making it perfect. The Nomergon video, for instance, was an eight and a half page script, ended up being 23 minutes long, and I spent like five days working on that. And the reality is, if I were to make detailed scripts for every single one of these playstyles where I talk about all of the stuff that I've just talked about, talents, runes, playstyles, pets, utility, for every single build, we'd be here forever. I could probably trim out some of the fat. There were a few times where I maybe discussed pros and cons between the builds that isn't 100% necessary, though I do think it is like slight interesting information for people who aren't aware. But I think realistically, I just would never have the time to do that. So this is kind of a necessary evil that I have to make these longer, slightly unscripted videos to actually get these things out in time so you guys can have access to this information. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any feedback on this style, I'm still looking to refine it a little bit. So within the next few days, I'll probably be discussing the destruction setup because it is fairly straightforward. I will cover that next. Then I will cover the affliction build, as mentioned, the one that I recommend for mechanical imagery and for dungeon running. And then there's just a lot of other little warlock related things that I would like to cover. One of the main topics that is really difficult to address because it is important added context, and I tried to talk about it when necessary, is I discussed offhands. Right? And which is the best offhand? Why is Firestone not good? Why are these other offhands better? And that is kind of just a small subset of a much larger point, that being Warlock tank gearing, which is something that I've seen a lot of confusion and misinformation about. And I would love to set the record straight on that. So if you are curious about that stuff, if you like the discussion on offhands, I am currently working on a much larger video where I have like four different best in slot lists prepared and recommended like BIS builds and like priorities and stuff like that, depending on your play style. It's a big work in progress because I've been spending a shit ton of time researching it, practicing it, like diving through logs to make sure that all of my, you know, theoretical stuff actually works out in practice. And there's a lot of difficult stuff to consider. So I could sit here and talk about like why demonology wants certain armor pieces more than others. And that technically falls within the scope of demonology, but that is something that I'm going to just talk about in a separate video regarding gearing. But I guess to wrap things up, if there are any things that you think are important that I forgot to talk about, any crucial demonology tidbits that I neglected to mention, please ask in the comments. I've gotten a lot of really great questions on both my previous Nomergon guide and on the video I made a few months ago about Everlasting Affliction Dungeon Tanking. I'd like to think I left pretty satisfying answers to those questions. It's impossible to fully anticipate every little question that somebody may have. I tried to get as many out there as possible now, but I'm sure I missed something, so please let me know in the comments. I will do my best to answer. But anyways, if you enjoyed watching this video, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could toss it a like, as that'll help other people find it as well, and I will catch you in the next Warlock Guide. Peace.